The Face in the Frost by John Belairs, 10. At first, Prospero felt that he was inside one of the green glass globes. Everything looked the way it does when you hold a piece of colored cellophane up in front of your eyes, except that it was all rounded, bowed outward. Things in the distance diminished into tiny curved perspectives. Then the walls of the globe spread outward, farther, farther, and the green faded to the cold dark of a winter night. He was standing at the crossroads. There were the high banks made higher by long white drifts. There were the bare black trees, and overhead the branches of a huge oak creaked under piles of wet snow. But there was no stone marker, Prospero was standing where it should have been, on a little triangular patch of raised ground. A white light lay all around him, and when he looked up into the thick, wet, slowly falling flakes, he saw a swaying lamp overhead, a bare electric bulb with a fluted porcelain reflector. It hung from a long black wire. He stood there with the green paperweight in his hand, looking up at the frigid, dazzling cold light. He felt empty, drained, and he knew that he had no magic power left. His bag and staff were back at the cottage with Roger, not that they would be any help to him now. He couldn't charm a single snowflake out of the air. Was this his punishment? And was he exiled to some place that existed only in the world of those globes, while Melicus was free to finish what he had started? The snow fell quietly, settling on his shoulders in wet, sticky patches. And as it got darker, he began to get the feeling that he dreaded. Someone was coming up the road on his left. He could not see anything there, outside the cold, slowly swaying circle of lamplight. The road ran off into a tangle of skeletal trees. But someone was coming. Melicus was coming for him. Now, far down the road, he could see a tiny yellow point of light, bobbing. Wrapping his woolen cloak around him and turning up his collar, the snowflakes were icy on his neck. He started to run in the other direction. The snow had packed down into a slick, smooth track under the loose, sparkling flakes. He fell down, got up, skidded, and fell down again, his hands sinking into the stinging cold. He crawled on his hands and knees to the sunken shoulder of the road and found that he could walk in the drifts. Frozen grass crunched under him, and the wind began to blow in his face. Dots of snow rushed at him out of the darkness, and he had to keep wiping his eyes as he staggered along. He kept walking as fast as he could for what must have been several miles. Sometimes he fell into a hole filled with rotten leaves or scraped his leg on a snow-covered post, but he kept going. Every now and then he looked behind him, and the moving light was still there. Once a car came around a bend, a boxy black shape, crawling slowly behind two frosted moons of light, but he hid in the ditch until it was gone. He doubted that they could or would help anyone who looked the way he did, and for some reason he did not want to meet any of the people in this world, not just yet. If there was a way out of all this, he felt he would have to find it himself. But the light was getting nearer. At the top of a low hill under a huge chestnut tree that dropped shovelfuls of snow on him as he stood looking around uncertainly, Prospero stopped to rest. He saw that he was standing under a stone wall and that there was a little flight of stairs nearby. It was merely a soft, bumpy incline in all this snow, but maybe he could climb it. As he made his way toward it, he noticed a large, flat wooden sign propped against one of the ball-topped gateposts. He brushed away the snow with a stinging, reddened hand, struck a match, and read, M. Millhorn, lawn mowers and axes sharpened, hammer handles made, used nails and back doors for sale. Prospero rubbed more snow away from the bottom of the sign. That was what it said, all right. He tried to laugh, but it came out a phlegmy cough. <clears throat> well, M. Millhorn, you sound interesting. Here we come. Prospero kicked some footholds in the snow that covered the steps, and he slowly climbed up, plunging his hands into the snow in front of him to steady himself. At the top, he stood in the knee-high snow and stared into the swirling dark. There, behind a couple of skinny pines, was a big square farmhouse with deep-set cornice windows and a scalloped roof tree. A light was on downstairs, but the yellow shades, patched with colored pieces of newspaper, were drawn. He kicked his way through the snow, making long scars in the wet drifts. From this height, he had a good view of the road, and when he looked, he saw, far down the row of fence posts, the light. It stopped, dropped to a lower position, then rose and went slowly swinging along, as if the bearer had stopped to look at foot for footprints. 
They wouldn't be hard to find, Prospero thought, and he kicked harder at the packed snow in front of him. Moving at this spread-legged awkward gait, he took a long time, or what seemed a long time, to reach the front steps. Up on the narrow front stoop, he banged with a numb fist on the yellow door, thumping and bumping inside, and a sound like someone upsetting a bag, a keg of nails. Finally, the door opened, and there, in the harsh glare of a single bulb that hung from a long knotted cord, was a small man with a square-cut beard. He wore oval, rimless spectacles and a black skull cap, and over his shoulder was a black silk shawl with elaborate gold tassels. He stripped four le- his striped floor-length robe, somewhere between a dressing gown and a cassock, might once have been brown and blue. He looked Prospero up and down and laughed silently. Well, come in. You'll catch your death out there. Prospero thanked him and stepped in the door, brushing snow off his cloak as he went. The room was an incredible mess. Cracked chamber pots, upended sewing machines, fat-lipped batoons, iron-wheeled lawnmowers, axe handles stacked like rifles, fussy fringed floor lamps with green marble insets, an ice and glass windowed stove with a brass vase on top and several kegs of bent nails. One of them tipped over. On the wall was a crazy collection of picture frames with some dark pictures in them. One of them showed several dogs with pipes in their mouths. They were sitting around a table playing poker. The little man stood looking at Prospero for a couple of seconds and then he turned sharply and went to the window. Raising the dirty shade a couple of inches, he looked out. From what I can see, he said, you don't have much time. You better do what I tell you. Prothero gaped. He felt an urge to run around the room, touching things. Are you real? Is this house real? The man laughed quietly with his tongue between his teeth. <laughs> well, these days you can't tell. Yes, I'm real. A damn sight more real than you are, if you catch my meaning. Well... Let's get going. I've been waiting for this a long time. He went to a high-glazed bookcase full of bellium-backed volumes. From where he stood, Prospero could read titles like Aristotle's Opera and Mysterium Cosmographicum. Standing on a cane-bottomed chair, the man lifted down from the top of the case a huge untitled tome with the seal of Solomon stamped on the side. He lugged it over to a large wooden lectern and opened it. It was full of black shaded Hebrew characters. Prospero knew what it was, and he looked with awe at the man who was unconcernedly thumbing through the book. The Kabbalah? Prospero asked. The Kabbalah. Now hurry downstairs and find the door you want. When I say back door is for sale, that's what I mean. But can I pay you? What can I do? I don't you don't know how grateful I am. Yes, I do. For payment, though, I'll take this little glass to that. It can't be worth much, but it'll look nice on the mantel. Prospero looked at him. The little man looked back, smiling quietly. But at that moment, the front door banged open and a cold, and a rush of cold wind blew a thin line of snow skittering across the floor. Outside, at the bottom of the snowy steps, they could see the light of a single square lantern. The man talked fast and nervously now. Give me that thing, for God's sake. You can't help me now, and you can't take it back with you. One way or another, I'll keep him from getting in. So get on with you. Go! Prospero looked at the yellow light that hung in a fog of snowflakes, at the man in the black skull cap who held out his hand, and he gave him the paperweight. He turned to go, but with his hand on the knob of the cellar door, he turned and looked. The man was dragging the lectern over to the fr- over in front of the door. Now Prospero was clumping down the thin slats of the cellar stairs, Leaning against the wall opposite him was a row of doors, big panel doors with peeling black paint, ivory-colored doors with broken star-frosted panes, a door covered with speckled brown leather and pyramid-headed nails. The line stretched away into the coal-smelling dark basement, and Prospero walked along it, pulling doors toward him and looking behind them, nothing but rough mortared stones. Overhead, a mournful, winding, high-pitched chant started but it was cut off by an incredibly angry word. A long flash of blue light shot down the cellar stairs. Prospero, several yards away, could feel the heat of it. Doors, doors, doors. For a minute, he had the horrible fear that he would see the two of them coming down the stairs after him. Then he stopped short. In front of him was a little pointed door that looked like a tombstone. A dirty yellow card was stuck to it with a red thumbtack. The card said, 
root cellar. There was no doorknob, of course, so Prospero tried the opening spell. Nothing happened. Overhead, the war between the wandering chant and the loud bursting voice went on. The cobwebbed ceiling shook, bits of dirt shifted from the shaking and grinding rafters, and a chamber pot flew down the stairs. It smashed on the wall with a loud pop, like a huge light bulb. Prospero stood looking at the door, his arm at his side. Then suddenly he smiled and laughed, shaking his head. He grabbed the door with both hands and lifted it toward him. It was not fastened to anything and came away from the wall easily. Behind it was a long tunnel and a slippery-looking rock incline. Carrying the door in front of him like a shield, he backed into the tunnel, setting down the heavy wooden slab when it, when it was, he hoped, back in place. He could not hear the noises overhead anymore. Prospero took one step in the darkness and fell down. He slid and kept on sliding on wet, chunky stones that bit into his back as he fell. It was not a steep incline, but there was no way of stopping, and by the time he got to the bottom, he was shaken, nauseated, and bruised. He looked around and saw that he was in, the, in a forest that looked familiar, of ordinary elms, oaks, and maples. If ordinary elms, oaks, and maples can look familiar, it was the forest behind his house. Now he was running down a path he had walked along many times on quiet afternoons in the late slanting light. The owls of his nightmare appeared overhead and swooped down on him, great hissing moon-eyed bags of dusty feathers. He swung at one, and it ripped open, emptying on him a cloud of green buzzing insects. They clung to his face and bit, brushing his eyelids with rustling wings. He ran on with his eyes closed, waving his arms, and suddenly the bugs dropped up, dropped off him, dead. He was in his backyard. Everything looked the way it had in the magic glass. The lines of snow, the frost in the windows, he saw that the fountain was not running. A long, muddy streak ran down the satyr's sides, and the marble basin was full of caked, smelly earth. Two dead birds lay in it. The apple tree was covered with dead, rattling leaves and the small, wrinkled, mushy brown, and small, wrinkled, mushy brown stones. Everything lay under a dull gray light. The bulging clouds overhead looked as though they were going to burst. Every object in the yard threw a shadow, a small, dark, trembling patch. One of them, cast by nothing that Prospero could see, lay on the grass near him. It started to crawl toward him slowly. He shoved his way through the bare for Cynthia branches and reached the back door. His key already in his hand, the lock turned, the door opened, he was inside. And when he slammed the door behind him, he could feel something rushing back into place. The house was under siege. Prospero went about lighting candles in the musty dark, they burned with a pale, greasy glare and sometimes guttered out in a wind that was not blowing. Outside, behind the staring faces, the heavy dark waited. Now and then, as he went about the house examining the rooms, he put his hand on the outside wall and imagined that he felt it straining inward. The plaster was covered with wandering, thready cracks. He went on to the living room and pulled down magic books, one after the other, trying spells. Nothing worked. When he had tried about ten books, he threw the pile on the floor in the middle of the room, grabbed a Florence flask that had something brown crusted inside it, and smashed it in the fireplace. He went upstairs. In the glass-walled observatory, he picked up instruments and stared at them. The metal barometers were stuck on storm, and the liquid was high in the torricelli and pube. Prospero stood there idly wondering how there could be low pressure when the whole house seemed to have seemed about to cave inward, and then he started to think about what he could do. Nothing. He took off his glasses, rubbed his eyes, put the glasses on again, and sat on the edge of a desk, looking out over the dead landscape. He had been staring for some minutes when the clouds began to move very strangely. They came apart in places, in stringy rips and seams like torn cloth. The sky that showed behind was, a dark, was dark red, and the garish light spattered on treetops, now the clouds were rushing about and heaving, shooting jabs of that bloody light in all directions. The shadows below contracted to pinpoints and shot suddenly out into acre-wide blots. Across the road that ran toward Breakspear, the ground opened, a huge saliva-strung mouth, and out of it crawled shapes with arms and legs, and now thunder or something like thunder, heavy, flat, ear-pressing booms without reverberations, each one louder than the next, 
In the crazy jumping red light, Prospero fell to the floor, his hands on his ears. Almost hysterically, he was thinking the same thing over and over. What can I do? What can I do? What? The key. Gwythian of Carleone's key. It was still in his inner pocket. Now, what to use it on? He had a key for every bureau drawer and cupboard in the house, except... Of course! Prospero got up and started down the steps as the booming and flashing went on. The floor and walls seemed uncertain, as though they might not be there the next minute. He had the horrible feeling that needles and nails were about to shoot into his feet when he stepped forward and he, and he had to force himself to put one foot after another on the winding stairs, which were now bending and giving like the melting steps of the inn at Five Dials. Halfway down from the observatory, in the paneled wall of the corkscrew staircase was a little locked cubbyhole. Prospero had never known what it was for, and he had tried many times to pry it open. Now he had the key, and it went in, turning around twice. The little door popped open, and inside, in the rushing, retreating red light that was beating at the observatory windows, he saw a small carved squirrel with a note in its two buck teeth. The note said, Use the spell, fool. Spell? shouted Prospero, throwing the squirrel down the stairs. What spell? Then he knew. Down the stairs, rushing and stumbling, taking them two at a time, in the living room, he plowed through the books on the floor till he found the duplicate of the one he had put in his bag, the one that was God knows where now. In a loud splintery ripping of wood, a rising roaring of wind, and a cloud of plaster dust shooting down from the ceiling, and as the front door flew open and something Prospero refused to look at stepped in, he shouted the square-noted spell that had never been good for anything. The clocks run down and clogged with dust started to strike, at first wheezily, then in rapid pings and booms and wangs and wah 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 wahs. The brass kettles hanging on hooks over the kitchen stove boomed together. All the, this noise amazingly sounded over the flat thuds, which now grew softer and then trailed away, like ordinary summer thunder. The front door, in which no figure stood, banged gently in a wet-smelling breeze, and the light that threw its long, slanting, dusty rays in at Prospero's wet, dripping windows was the light of four o'clock on a bright October afternoon. And that's the end of chapter 10.